My name is Dr Olivia Kirtley and I am a research psychologist uh, specialising in suicidal behaviour and psychological distress. Um, and today I'm going to be speaking to you um, a bit about um, resilience and well-being in postgraduate research students. Um, so there's been a lot of things in the media about this recently and there's a lot of discussion in terms of we need to do something because the situation as it is is, is not acceptable. Uh, we need to do something. Um, but there's actually very little uh, then that, that happens and there's very little in terms of what we actually need to do. And so hopefully over the course of the next few minutes uh, I'm going to be talking you through some more directly practical tips uh, for things that you can do uh, immediately as a supervisor if you're concerned about a student or also to identify a student uh, who you feel may be uh, in, in distress um, and then also to talk about some of the, the wider problems um, which we might be wanting to address uh, on a larger scale at some point. So um, here have uh, a quote um, from one of the um, articles, one of the many articles that's been published recently uh, about postgraduate student mental health. Um, and it's this idea that actually empathy doesn't cost us anything. Um, and it's sort of a, a rallying call, call to arms, really, because um, the situation as it is can't really go on. Um, there are postgraduate research students who are taking their own lives because they are in such a degree of psychological distress. There are postgraduate research students who are dropping out of their studies um, because they're finding uh, that they, they can't manage and that they are not getting the support that they need. Um, and there is a culture um, very generally in academia but also um, quite particularly for postgraduate research students um, that basically if you work every hour that uh, is, is available to you then somehow it's this sort of badge of honour that overwork is a badge of honour um, and overwork as we know leads to higher levels of stress uh, and to greater levels of distress than if this is something that happens over a long period of time. So one of the things that I um, get asked quite a lot is, well, how do I actually know if a student is struggling? So there's a variety of different ways that you uh, sort of get alarm bells over this. So one of them is that uh, students will perhaps start to reschedule or cancel their supervision meetings. So sometimes um, if students start playing around with the times of, of meetings and say, oh no, actually, can we meet a bit further in the future? Um, or actually, no, I'm really sorry, I, I can't make that meeting. Um, it's actually a sign that they're, they're sort of maybe not managing so well. And um, perhaps they need a little bit of extra support um, because it could be that they're rescheduling meetings because they're, they're trying to uh, avoid you however nice you are as a, a supervisor um, maybe they feel ashamed that they haven't managed to keep up with some work or that they feel that they're falling behind uh, as well there are sometimes changes in the frequency of communications so sometimes you'll have students who uh, work very well independently and you'll only hear from them every so often uh, perhaps these students may then start to email you a lot more and you'll notice a, an increase in frequency of their communications to you or knocking on your office door or trying to get hold of you um, and likewise uh, on the other side of things if you have students who are usually very regular communicators you may find that suddenly they drop off the radar uh, and that you may you don't get responses to emails or perhaps they only email you very very occasionally where before they've been very good at keeping in touch regularly. So both of these things can actually be a sign that the student uh, is struggling and needs some extra support um, because if they're maybe trying to reach out to you but they're not perhaps feeling as though they can directly say that they have a problem, you'll notice sort of other um, kind of behaviours uh, like maybe increasing uh, how often they email you or trying to, to get hold of you at your office or also um, disappearing a bit as well. So it's good to watch out for these these changes from the, the, norm, uh, the normal behaviour of the, the student as potentially a sign that they need some extra support. As well, um, missing deadlines. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, this wonderful quote from the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is, uh, you know, I, I love deadlines, I love the sound of them as they go whooshing past. Um, and there is this sort of trope of um, postgraduate students and, and academics that uh, are not very good at meeting deadlines. Um, but actually, uh, when students perhaps start to consistently miss deadlines or maybe they've historically been very, very good at meeting deadlines and then suddenly uh, that deadline goes whooshing past without you receiving anything, uh, it could be a sign that they're really um, finding it difficult to manage their workload um, or that they're feeling a bit overwhelmed by the, the stress of, of trying to get everything done. Um, 
also as well, um, which is not often spoken about, is that sometimes students uh, achieve these levels of productivity that are, are almost kind of unfeasible. Uh, and you're thinking, how actually are they managing to get this done? Um, and this is also potentially a sign that the student is um, feeling a bit overwhelmed and a bit distressed because you have to think, well, if they're achieving this uh, potentially unachievable task in this, uh, this very short space of time, then what is actually costing them in terms of the rest of their, their life? Are they missing seeing friends or family or sleep or meals or you know exercise or, or other things that are, are, are keeping them well? Um, so it's really good to keep an eye on whether people are meeting their deadlines or not or whether they seem to be, um, things seem to be going a, li a little too well, a little bit too perfectly. As well, um, students who are struggling will often be at great pains to show you that actually everything is going okay and that they're managing. Um, and sometimes whilst as a supervisor you might think, oh, this is great because they're managing to do everything and, and more, actually this could be a sign, again, that it's costing them something in terms of the, the, the non-work aspects of their life that you're not seeing. Um, so if students are, are really trying to, to convince you that actually everything's okay, so, oh, well, you know, I didn't actually do this, but I did this, this and this, and, and then I'm going to do that next week and then I'm going to do that the week after um, then maybe it's also a sign that things are um, you know, causing a strain for the student so it's good to watch out um, to see if they are uh, managing with everything and maybe they, they need a little bit of extra support there as well Negative self-talk uh, can also be something that is a, a sign that students are distressed. Um, so if they say, oh, well, you know, I, I didn't do that, but, you know, I'm, I'm rubbish at that, or, well, I'm just, I'm really, I'm struggling, and it's just, you know, typical that I'm, I'm struggling and I'm finding it hard, or I'm, I'm useless, or I'm rubbish, or I'm, I'm a failure, things like this, um, can also be a sign that actually for this student things are, are not going so well, because if they're feeling very, very bad um, to the point where they're constantly talking themselves down, this can become quite a negative cycle whereby they eventually begin to believe these uh, negative and untrue things that they're saying about themselves. So it's always good to watch out for instances of, of what we call negative self-talk where someone talks themselves down um, and, and says they're a failure or things like this because um, this could also be a sign um, that the student is maybe lacking in self-confidence or, or feeling a little bit low or blue. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, students for whom everything seems like it's going fine um, are also students who you need to check in with um, because it could be that whilst everything seems fine on the surface, actually they're going to extraordinary lengths to cover up the fact that they're struggling because they feel that if they ask for help or if they say that they're having a problem, then they will seem less in your eyes as a supervisor. Um, a lot of students, in fact I'd say the vast majority of students really put their supervisors on a pedestal. They've wanted to come and work with you, they've wanted to join your lab, they've wanted to have your input and your supervision and they really idolise you and, and they see the talks you give and the papers you, you publish and things like this and you're, you're the kind of hero or their heroine. And so when they admit that maybe things aren't going so well for them, sometimes it makes them feel as if they're failing, although they will you will not be interested in them anymore or they'll not seem as good in, in your eyes. So it's really, really good to also check in with the students for whom everything seems absolutely perfect. Is it seeming too perfect? Is it kind of beyond belief? Is it too good to be true? Um, and it sort of links into the fact that actually we don't just need to check in with students when we see them visibly distressed. We need to check in with students all the time because sometimes when it gets to a point where the student is so distressed that we can see it, actually that's quite far down the line and ideally we need to be stopping um, distress and, and helping where we can before it gets to such a, a serious point. One of the things I also get asked is what can I do if a student is struggling? So as I mentioned before, checking in with the student um, about how they're feeling and not just their productivity because these two things are not necessarily related. You may think, oh, well, if a student is producing work very well and then this shows that everything's okay. But actually some students are being very productive because they're terrified and they're afraid of failing. Um, and in fact, it's, it's fear and distress which is driving these uh, sort of uh, unfeasible levels of productivity. So it's really, really important also to check in with students how they're feeling, particularly maybe when they're starting a PhD, 
it's a very new environment, it's a very new routine for them to get into uh, compared to their undergraduate studies uh, or even a master's. And so it's good to, to check in and see how they're doing and how they're, they're finding things as well. Are they feeling a bit lost? Are they feeling lonely? Are they feeling isolated? Are they feeling a bit stuck? It's important to, to check in with your students about how they feel and not just about the work. Sometimes students will disclose problems to you, personal or work problems, um, and it's important that you, you really listen to these and you don't sort of just gloss them over. Um, a lot of students can feel sometimes a bit uncomfortable um, with disclosing problems um, to uh, their, their supervisors, and sometimes as well supervisors can feel uncomfortable hearing these problems. But what's really important is that you, you listen, um, you acknowledge that the student has shared something with you that could be actually very difficult for them to share, it could be very personal very painful um, and you act, validate the distress that the students are experiencing um, or, the, or the worry and that's very important so that the student doesn't just feel um, that you're brushing it off and that you don't care so it's really important to directly acknowledge that students shared something with you um, and that uh, potentially this is something that's very distressing for them. It's also important to ask if you can do something to help. The student may actually just want to get something off their chest rather than you actively helping. So it's good if they disclose a problem to you to say, OK, is there anything that I can do to help or that you think I can do? Um, and also think more on this as, as well in terms of perhaps there are other services that the student is not aware of that could benefit the student in these circumstances. So ask if, you would like, uh, if the student would like you to, to help them and maybe they say no and that's okay as well but the point is they know then that if they do actually need you to intervene or they do need your help in the future that that help is available to them. Don't also feel um, that if you start a conversation with a student about something that's potentially distressing that you need to fill all the silences. Um, it's something that is very important to learn as a, as a psychologist when you're interviewing uh, patients and participants um, is that actually the silences are when some of the most important things happen. Um, so don't feel as the, the person essentially in the position of power, as the supervisor, that it's your job to fill those silences. Um, sometimes maybe, yes, it feels a bit frightening and a bit uncomfortable to leave these silences, um, but actually this is really, really important and sometimes you'll find that uh, when you leave these opportunities for a student to talk, then they will fill the silences with their worries or, um, you know, talking more about the, the problem that they disclosed to you. Don't also feel that you have to um, resolve a problem completely um, in, in one supervisory session. That's not really how life works. So sometimes problems will persist for uh, maybe days or weeks, months, years even. Um, for example, if it's a, a chronic health condition or a, a mental health condition as well. Um, this is not something that can be tied up neatly uh, in, uh, in paper and string in, in one session. So don't feel that you have to resolve everything and tie it all up. But make sure you revisit it in future supervisory sessions as well. Um, and equally don't feel that you have to have all of the answers. Sometimes students just want to um, disclose their worries to you. They're not necessarily depending on you for a, a solution. Um, sometimes um, you can feel very, very concerned about a student um, to the point where you're worrying that they're thinking of taking their own life. Um, and it's important in these circumstances to ask directly about this. So don't uh, use euphemisms about this, like uh, you think you're doing something stupid, which is very stigmatising as well as not really giving you any useful information. Uh, you think you're hurting yourself, uh, things like this. If you're worried that a student uh, may be thinking of taking their own life, it's really important to ask directly. Are you thinking of suicide? Have you had thoughts about killing yourself? Have you had thoughts about taking your own life? Um, and then it's also very important, um, and I appreciate perhaps quite frightening, um, that you need to be prepared the answer might be yes. And in these circumstances, um, it's really good to be able to refer the student then on to the university counselling service. And we're very fortunate here at Glasgow that we have a very good uh, counselling service for students. But also immediately... Um, the student's GP, for example, and also Samaritans, which is free to call um, in the UK. Um, so if the, you feel the student is in immediate need of, of assistance, um, maybe then connecting them with, with other services uh, as well is a, an important thing to do. Um, but always ask the student as well. Um, the main thing is that you, you ask the question um, sometimes as well. People say that they actually feel very relieved when someone asks the question because they haven't really known how to phrase uh, those thoughts themselves so it can open up a, a discussion. But don't feel you have to deal with this alone as well as a supervisor. 
refer to university counselling services or also um, speak to the student about um, other options like Samaritans or like going to their GP. So um, I've spoken a little bit now in terms of what can we can we do. So on a larger scale, um, and this quote uh, again is from the um, Guardian um, academic section. It's Academics Anonymous, um, and it's about why I love my PhD. And I have to say, this is one uh, quote that really stayed with me, not for very positive reasons, because it gives this idea, um, which is really a pervasive and poisonous myth in academia, that somehow if a student is struggling, it's because they're not working hard enough or because they're not cut out for it or because what they're doing isn't worthwhile enough. Um, and I think this is quite possibly one of the most dangerous myths um, that perpetuates in academia um, because it suggests that somehow anyone who has a problem just isn't cut out for it and isn't good enough and should just basically leave academia or their PhD. And this is the impression that a lot of students get. And articles like this whilst obviously this wasn't the attention, um, actually really perpetuate this kind of idea that somehow having a problem means you're a failure and that's absolutely not correct. And as supervisors, we really, really need to make sure that we um, foster this idea that it's completely normal sometimes to have points in your PhD where something goes wrong or you don't understand or that you're finding it difficult to keep up. That's a normal part of the process. And learning the skills and uh, to be able to, to manage these situations is a, a really key part of your research apprenticeship of becoming an academic. So in terms of my own research, which um, is about suicide and self-harm, um, there are a number of risk factors um, which are linked to having thoughts of suicide or of attempting suicide, um, which are also very um, frequent within uh, PhD students and with the academic community more widely. So one of these is perfectionism, so particularly social perfectionism, where you feel as though you're constantly failing to meet the high standards of others. Um, this is something that we... Um, um, hear reported a lot um, by by students um, and this can really um, cause issues in terms of if a student feels like they're not meeting your expectations as a supervisor or they're not keeping up with their peers perhaps their colleague also in the same lab um, has just got a publication and they've just got a publication rejected um, and so maybe in these circumstances the student perhaps feels like they're just they're not good enough then they're not going to be good enough they're never going to be good enough they're never going to meet these expectations and one of the reasons why perfectionism is so pernicious um, is because it's actually the person's own perception of what other people think. So contrary uh, even to all available evidence, um, they will still continue to believe that they're, they're not good enough. And it's important to try and get them to, to dispute these things. What evidence do I have that I'm a failure? What evidence do I have that I can't uh, get a paper or things like this? Um, and it's good to make sure you watch out for um, when a student seems like they're, they're sort of leaning more towards perfectionism. Rumination as well uh, is an important factor that's been associated with both suicidal thoughts and behaviours. So a student broods on their, their problems, for example, and it's all about the problem turning over and over and over in their mind, very repetitive thought patterns, rather than focusing on solutions. So try and identify uh, times when, when this is maybe happening and, and attempt to sort of break the cycle by trying to refocus the student on uh, on other solutions to the, the problem that they're having. And this also links uh, to the next point of goal engagement uh, and disengagement. So perhaps something, um, the student put in an application for something and it didn't uh, succeed, um, then it's important to try and re-engage the student with a, a new goal uh, instead of sort of letting them focus on this, um, this goal that, that hasn't worked out. Um, it's important though as well to let the student have sort of morning time for this as well. If you get a paper rejected uh, or if you get a grant application rejected, it is sad and it's okay to be sad about that. Um, but it's important to make sure that the student sees that you know this is this is one thing and there are other opportunities so that they don't get too focused uh, on the thing that hasn't succeeded. Um, lack of connectedness and isolation is also a real problem, particularly when students are working in a very niche area and perhaps are not always in the office or they're in an office where not everyone else is always there and it's very easy for students to become isolated. Um, so it's good to try and encourage social opportunities within your group, within your lab, um, have people meet for lunch or, or things like this. Uh, give this idea that it's okay to leave your desk for lunch as well because too many people are just eating lunch at the desk. It just becomes an extension of their working day. It's important to have this break so that you can meet other people uh, and you can talk to them about any worries that you might be having more informally. 
Uh, having not very many coping resources is also a factor when you're working very hard. Um, sometimes your self-care behaviours can, can decrease. So exercise, eating well, drinking water, taking time out and things like this, taking vacation time. Um, and so when you don't have um, a lot of coping resources, when you meet a, a challenge, so like having a paper rejected or an experiment going wrong, um, then you don't have so many things to, to, to answer uh, to that challenge. So it's good to try and build students' coping resources and encourage them um, to, to care for themselves um, as preparation as, as part of their, their normal academic life. As well, um, there is uh, lots of research linking a lack of positive future thinking um, to self-harm and suicide. So if um, a student is not able to see that there is a positive future for themselves, and particularly this is um, the case for students finishing their PhD in terms of the quite precarious job market uh, at the moment for postgraduate students and for um, postdocs, um, it's really important to encourage them to um, see that there are opportunities available and whilst they may be challenging, it's not that there, there isn't anything out there. So trying to encourage positive thoughts about the future is really important as well. And it's important as well not to neglect other stresses. Um, so for example, a student may be under a lot of financial stress, doing a PhD um, is not necessarily uh, an inexpensive process. They may also have a part-time job, they may have family to support, um, and so the financial strain can also be a, a massive, massive stress for students. So it's good to be realistic about this as a supervisor and to not uh, overlook this important aspect that could be stressing the student out as well. So. In terms then, um, we've talked about risk factors, but something as well is that we need to promote positive uh, protective factors as well. Um, so we need to be much better at celebrating success in academia. When a student gets a paper accepted, maybe as a supervisor you've had 500 papers accepted and that's fantastic, um, but it's good to remember back um, you know, previously when you had your first paper accepted and that seemed like the only thing in the world. And in um, a, a field where actually often there are very um, few things to, to celebrate and there is lots of rejection. It's really important to celebrate the successes. So your student got a paper accepted, fantastic, tell them well done, tell them congratulations. They got a £50 travel grant, fantastic, that was really, really great because they had to write the application or, or, or things like this. So try and emphasise the, the positives as well um, because there are far more um, negatives than there are positives. So really make sure that the positives shine through for your students. Self-care, um, I've, I've mentioned earlier on, uh, is really, really important and this should be something that isn't used as a band-aid when things go wrong. This is something that should be firmly embedded within research culture and academic culture more generally. So as a supervisor, it's good to lead by example. So are you sending the student emails at three o'clock in the morning um, and are you expecting responses at 11 o'clock at night? Uh, because this is not really encouraging healthy self-care for the student uh, and they get the idea that unless they're emailing you at 11 o'clock uh, at night, then you'll see that they won't be working hard enough. Um, also taking exercise, taking time away from your desk for lunch, uh, taking holiday as well is very, very important. Uh, if a student sees that you never leave the lab and you don't take any holiday, they'll think that that's something that you expect. They'll think that is what is expected of them. Uh, and so it's really, really important that you model these, these good self-care behaviours as well. You encourage them in your students. When you see them in your students, uh, then you should, um, you should tell them that they're doing a good job and you should reward um, these, these positive behaviours as well. If you are in a position where you can, um, it's very important that you facilitate um, social activities as well. So perhaps it's a nice thing to do to have a lab lunch where every member of your lab comes along and you all sit together and you eat lunch together or to go for drinks or something like this. Maybe something off campus as well is nice because students perhaps feel more relaxed then. Um, and it fosters this genuine idea that actually you care about the students and that the environment that they are working in is, is an environment where people care about each other and they look out for each other. It's also very important because if a student has been a good socialiser and comes along to all these events and suddenly you notice that they're not there, then maybe it suggests that actually they're struggling um, to keep up with their workload or something's not going right for them. So these are also opportunities you can spot if a student's struggling. So if you are in a position where you can facilitate this, try and make sure that you build positive social networks as well um, within your colleagues and your, your lab groups. So um, 
I hear sometimes um, as well for, for all these articles that uh, say there's a problem in academia with, with mental health um, and self-care. Um, I hear lots of people saying, well, actually, that's, that's not the case and, and nobody's really interested in this. Um, and so uh, as an avid uh, tweeter myself, um, I, uh, I decided to put out a, a tweet asking other academics on Twitter for what had helped them during times when they felt distressed uh, and what was good for their self-care. What did they do to take care of themselves? Um, and actually I had quite an overwhelming um, response so you'll see from, from some of the, uh, the, the tweets um, that I've screenshotted behind me that actually people are really really invested in this people really do care so there are lots of um, good ideas here including taking regular exercise making sure that you maintain a hobby that's not to do with your work because a lot of people find that their social life as well shrinks quite dramatically when they become a PhD student because other friends who may be not in academia or they're in a different discipline um, don't quite have a schedule that fits with their demanding PhD schedule so it's really good to try and keep grounded by having some things that aren't actually to do with academia or aren't to do with your, your PhD topic. Um, as well, some of the tweets here will emphasise that there's uh, a real importance in having social support. So in meeting other PhD students and other early career researchers, either online by Twitter, which is a fantastic resource for academics, um, or by going along to postgraduate um, meetups, or by just hanging out with other people in, in the lab. And it's really important because this fosters this idea that it's okay to talk about things and that it's okay to reach out to other people um, and when you find that people talk informally amongst themselves about these kind of things they see that actually um, other people also have these problems and it makes them think oh maybe this is this is normal maybe I'm not the only one uh, so I'd strongly urge you also to suggest that um, it's good for students to to network and to join Twitter to socialize with each other because this gives um, a really supportive environment for the, the student to uh, grow up in as a researcher. So in some, um, don't be afraid to ask students um, how they're doing, how they're feeling, not just in terms of their work, because these things are not necessarily related. If you check in with your students regularly, then it just becomes part of your routine. It's not as though you're checking up on them um, or you're trying to catch them out or something like this. So make sure you check in regularly as just part of your normal uh, supervisory routine with the student. With self-care, it's great to lead by example. Make sure that they see that you're taking breaks, that you're taking holidays, that you are going out of your office for lunch uh, and that you're doing things to take care of yourself. Self-care, um, if nothing else, is um, preparation for future work because if you're healthy and you're happy, then you're going to work a lot better uh, and you're going to be able to withstand those knocks like having a paper or a grant rejected a lot better uh, than if you are low on coping resources. As well as watching out for risk factors, um, like when a student seems like they're distressed, boosting protective factors is really important. So again, I can't emphasise enough how important it is to foster good social relationships amongst your, your lab colleagues and get your students to, to know other students and to be able to talk to them as well. And in terms then of... Um, other, other things that we can do, we need to think about how we can use um, the existing resources that are available within the university, for example, like the counselling service, and how we can maybe build new resources that are a better fit for the purpose uh, of supervising students in this, in this climate uh, of academia that we're in at the moment. <laughs>